All right, so recording is on. Okay, so let's, uh, recording is on, share screen. So as I was saying, so this, uh, starting today, we are going back to supervised learning. Okay, now we're gonna focus on the uh, also important uh, field of uh, neural nets, right? Uh, that, you know, takes us into um, deep neural networks. So uh, basically up around this week, April 5th or so, we're gonna take it, we're gonna reach, we're gonna get to uh, deep neural networks and in particular Keras. So you'll see it's not that difficult um, to do. And this actually is, you know, state of the art, right? So we'll be using TensorFlow for this, but it shouldn't be that, that difficult to do. After that, uh, we'll have a couple of weeks left, hopefully to just cover some additional topics um, that I wanna cover, like, you know, going back to clustering and the K-means algorithm and a few other uh, miscellaneous topics. But at that, you know, basically once we get to April 7th, and we've covered Keras and uh, deep neural networks. I feel that you know we're in, you know we're we've achieved most of the goals of the course. Everything else is really just you know special topics or uh, things that I wanted to you know mention. We've covered a lot of the important topics already. So if you remember, just what is machine learning? A couple of machine learning supervised learning algorithms. Then we went into unsupervised and singular value decomposition. We looked at recommender systems. We also looked at compression with singular value decomposition. And then we looked at reinforcement learning. So now, uh, you know, we just have really this one main big topic, which is uh, deep neural networks, right? But before we get to deep neural networks, we kind of want to gradually uh, go through uh, all of it, right? So we're going to start historically. I haven't updated the calendar here. But we're going to start historically with uh, the, what is called the perceptron. So we'll take a look at the perceptron. We'll take our time this week with the perceptron. And then hopefully next week, a little bit of uh, logistic regression and linear regression and multilayer perceptrons, which allows us to get into, you know, Keras and deep neural networks. So it should be a nice sequence. Um, and like I said, at the end of the day, once you have, um, once you have Keras and deep, you know, deep NN, you, you can do a lot of things, a lot of powerful things, um, you know, as far as machine learning is concerned. Okay, so um, that's basically the plan. So I remind you, you know, basically six weeks, really five weeks presentations will be on April 26th. Usually I have two days, but you guys are a small uh, group. Therefore, uh, on April 28th, we'll just do some miscellaneous topic. I'm sure there's always something that we can cover on that last day as well. Uh, I don't anticipate that many homeworks left, right, uh, for the semester. So obviously there will be something on Keras in particular, uh, but otherwise uh, not that many homework assignments. Instead, I want you to work on your term project, right? Now, all of you have topics for term projects. Remind me. Uh, you just want to know, like, did we have one or what the topic was? What the topic is, yes. I know my question is yours. But what, what's the topic? Um, we're working on doing a recommender system. Mm -hmm. Good. And the other group? Uh... Uh, it's been a week, uh, Ryan, not sure, but, uh, number system or number recognition system. Um, a recommender system, you mean? Or, uh, no, like a re recognition, like a system for like, recognition. Oh, just, a, just a regular classification. You mean. Yeah. Sort of like the lab we did, except, um, just, I guess, with our own numbers, maybe like writing some kind of script that exports um, like uh, like a picture into Excel. And then from there we could. Right, so through. some type of classification basically. So it's gonna be a supervised learning problem. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, you know, I'm not looking for anything very complex. I just want you to do it right. That, that's, that's all it is, okay? So don't, don't stress over it. Um, 
but you know, we'll certainly, you know, you'll have whatever data set you have. I, I hope you recognize that you could run it with the KNN algorithm, the naive base algorithm. You could use the S singular valid decomposition for some compression. And then you could also use the perception that we're going to start today, or you could use Keras and a, and a deep neural network. So all of these tools could be applied to the same data set. So that's fine too. Okay. Um, so uh, the only topic that would be different it would be if you did something like reinforcement learning, but I don't think anyone is doing that. Um, and then these topics that we're going to cover at the end is too late in the semester to do a project on. Okay. All right, so uh, that so that's everything that I, you know. We are re, sort of restarting after a long break. You know, I I also forgot how to log into um, uh, Zoom. Obviously, my microphone, my new microphone, didn't work either. So, um, but you know, it, this is the 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 quick part of the semester, right? So you know, we're very close now. So this week, we're just going to take it easy and just kind of go back get get into it right so today i'm going to cover uh what is called as i said the uh the perceptron and i'll you know i'll talk it allow it gives me an opportunity to talk about history you know and everything uh that's a lot of a lot of fun all right so let's um switch over to the whiteboard here okay, so you should now be seeing the whiteboard There's the whiteboard. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about kind of like the history of this. And then, you know, remember, I should remind you, you know, uh, machine learning in general can be divided into supervised learning, right? So, supervised. learning and then unsupervised learning and then like reinforcement learning right so we covered reinforcement learning we're not going to uh, cover that topic anymore uh in this, sem this semester we covered supervised learning with what with uh knn right naive bayes right we've covered those two algorithms and then we've covered so far on supervised learning by talking about uh, singular value decomposition and its applications to compression and recommender systems. Remember that the difference is that with supervised learning, you've got the X data, but you also have labels. Y labels that you use to train the model. With unsupervised learning, you only use the X data. Remember, for instance, uh, the movie reviews, right? So we only had users and their reviews of movies. And in reinforcement learning, we kind of talked about how that, you know, I'm not going to get into the details of that. Just, I already kind of did that in another video. So just uh, remember, this is basically like the taxi cab example. Okay. So, now we are going back in the rest of the, at least for the next three weeks, we are going back to supervised learning. So that means data where we have, you know, the samples, the features, and then the classes, right? So is it a cat? Is it a dog, et cetera? But we're now going to look at a new um, family, if you want to call it that, of algorithms that are related, right? And, you know, I would just describe these as neural networks. And as it turns out, uh, some familiar uh, things that you've learned in statistics like linear regression and logistic regression can technically be modeled as uh, neural networks, right? So that's the interesting thing, okay? And so that's where we're going, you know, today we're gonna focus on uh, neural nets in general. That's, you know, our, our basic idea. So then, yeah, you know, since we are talking about neural nets here, uh, we have, neur oops. So we have uh, neural nets, right? And what is a neural network, right? So you always hear about this, oh, it's like the brain. So everybody says, you know, it's like the human brain and then there's the neurons and 
you know, all these connections. And so, you know, you got, so for instance, a person's eye, right? So it's supposed to be an eye. And then they see something and then it hits the retina, kind of, you know, something like that, right? And then that's, that retina image is mapped to neurons in your brain, right? And those are features. So technically, so the idea is that you see something, whatever it is, it hits the retina. The retina somehow is connected to, I don't know, you know, uh, neural, neural things, neural links in the brain, and those connect to different features or it's different uh, neurons in your brain. So our brains do have this idea of like neurons and links, right? So, and then the idea is that somehow at some point you learned, let's just say, let's just say that that, I'm going to use a different color. Well, that's a bad color. So yeah, so we're going to say that these neurons, that connection, and this set of connections over here of neurons have meaning. They have some kind of a meaning in your brain, right? And so wherever, whenever you see, let's say you see a cat, right? You see a cat there, um, or you see, you know, you see a dog, right? So you see a dog. Right, so you see a dog there. And so what happens is in some way, the cat image hits certain neurons, right? So it hits certain neurons. It acti what is called it activates. So let's say for whatever reason, it activates those neurons. Can you guys see that? And then those neurons across the brain somehow will connect and will activate to that center of information in your brain. And then therefore that, you know, when you see this thing, it's a cat. So this is somehow like a cat. And then on the other, on the other end, whenever you see a dog, you know, the dog triggers this neuron, but maybe it triggers one of the other neurons and it triggers this one and this one. And then those connections, right? go through other neurons and somehow activate the other center of your brain, which somehow has been mapped to dog. Do you guys see that? And so intuitively that is sort of where this is coming from, right? This idea that we have a brain, it's made up of neurons, it's made up of connections. You see something, you know, that light, those photons, I guess, hit the retina in your brain that part of the retina triggers in some way certain neurons and all of those connections that were made at some point, right? So when you're, you know, when you're a baby, you don't have these connections. You know, you see a cat and a dog, you don't know what they are. Uh, first, you need to figure out what our face is, you know, what are things, what are things that move, you know, et cetera. But eventually you've, you've built all of these structures in your head. And then at some point you have this meaning. So you see cat, you immediately triggered to a cat, you see a dog, you immediately trigger to this part of the brain. And then whatever this is connected to, you know, maybe you're afraid of dogs, right? Let's say that you're afraid of dogs. So then you have another center in your brain, you know, that another set of connections that has to do with trigger. And then there's the medulla, you know, oblongata, whatever that, that thing is called, right? That ha your reptile brain that deals with fear right? Fear. And so when you see dog, at some point, maybe a dog bit you and you created these links in your brain that go there. And then that goes to the fear center of your reptile brain. So whenever you see a cat, you know, there's no connection to the reptile brain. You're good, right? You see a dog, especially, you know, a, a, a specific type of dog, maybe, and it immediately it triggers your fear and you know then then this brain makes you act irrational right so or or rationally to protect yourself and so that's you know that's where neural nets now i don't like um to say for instance that artificial so this is you know 
This is just to show you where things are coming from. I'm not a brain surgeon or a neurosurgeon or anything like that. So this is just an idea that we all know about the brain, right? And so to kind of illustrate, so this would be a human neural net, but what we're gonna talk about is artificial neural nets, okay? So we're gonna talk about artificial neural networks, but they do capture the same idea, right? So what is the input to all of this? You know, the image of the cat or the dog, right? So that was your X, right? And then what was the Y of this? You know, the Y of this is, is it a cat or is it a dog? That's what you learned to map, right? And, you know, your brain is pretty fast. You know, biological systems are pretty fast. And so it's like electricity, right? And we know that electricity is almost um, sort of speed of light kind of thing. So it's pretty fast. So then uh, basically just like with the neural net, you have X and Y, right? X and Y. Um, so we have X goes into the neural net and we get Y just like we did in this analogy of the brain. Well, an A and N is also similar, right? So an artificial neural network is gonna be some kind of a construct in code, obviously. And, but we're gonna have an X parameter and then we're gonna have a Y parameter, right? So we, we are going to predict something given some input. Now, what goes on in here, right? That, you know, we can think of it as a black box, but that is, you know, the, art, the, the architecture of an artificial neural network, okay? Uh, so usually, if we think about the analogy over here of the brain, when, you know, we had some input, the cat picture, well, all right, so let's say we have a cat picture, right? And we have something like that. We have a cat and then we want to represent this as uh, just a vector, vector of information. So what I can do is I can take this piece. So I can take that piece, right, and move it here. And then I can take the next piece and move that there. And then I can take the next piece and move that there. And so on, dot, 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 until I grab the last piece dot, 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 and then, and now I, I end up with a vector. So if the image is, let's say, 28 by 28, then I end up with a vector that is of size 784. So my vector is going to be 784 there, right? And that's just the information, all the pixels in the image, for instance, right? So that becomes the input, okay? the input to the model, and then the output will be a class. In this case, is this a picture of a cat or a dog? So then we're gonna say, you know, is it zero or one? And that's it, right? So that's ultimately what we're trying to do here. So now if we think of a artificial neural network, uh, we have, um, you know, Let's say an input already defined, 784. This is just, you know, I'm taking a number. Uh, this is the input X, right? One sample in this case. And then we have an output over here, which will be um, the class, right? So the class could be, you know, is it a zero or one, et cetera. But the A and N has to be connected. Right, so just like we did here, right? You know, that's why I did kind of this analogy. So if the image goes into the retina, right? So it, it sort of become, it enters here, but then that retina, that image hits the retina. Like literally it hits uh, different receptors in the retina. And so those receptors are connected, linked to the individual neurons, right? And then neurons, you know, do whatever, they, whatever it is to get to, is it a cat or is it a dog, right? Either one. So the question is, how does it know how to be connected, right? And that's where a neural network comes in. So a neural network, then you create these architectures. It's, it's sort of like you create, you know, you imagine I have a brain. 
have a brain, let's say. And the brain will have, you know, neuron, 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 neuron. You know, however, and I can create any architecture of any depth that I want, right? And then I'm going to plug this in here, right? So usually what, what you do is you think, okay, I'm going to plug, you know, one layer and then another layer and then another layer. You decide, you're, it's called like architecture. So you decide the number of layers. So I, see, I, I did three here and the number of neurons per layer. Those are decisions that you make. You just decide that, okay, this is the input, just like here, the cat, right? So the cat is the input. The output, so we're gonna say input, and then we're gonna say output over here. So this is the output. The output is going to be, it has to be encoded in some way, but is it, do we want a cat or a dog? And then we say in between there's a brain of this architecture. However, the, the brain, you don't know what, what to connect, right? So, you know, for instance, we could have gone, um, we could have gone in this direction, right? So I could have gone in this direction for whatever reason to arrive at any, any of the other things, but I didn't, right? You know, for whatever reason, it was, you know, another direction that was taken. How does the brain know what direction to take? That's, you know, that's the brain. That's how it works. And that's kind of the same analogy with a, with a neural net, right? The neural net. So now you have 784. So each feature is a neuron, right? So think of it that way. Each feature is a neuron, right? So you have 784 individual neurons. And then over here, maybe we have one neuron for the output, which is going to be a zero or a one, or we could actually have two, you know, either way, right? We can have two neurons. But the question is, how do we connect? Because you can see all these layers are currently not connected, okay? So what needs to happen is that that's where, you know, this is called machine learning, right? So remember, it's called machine learning. So Currently, you've created an architecture. You've created an architecture, but you haven't learned yet. So now with the architecture, you need to learn. So you're going to learn. And then once you learn, you might learn that whenever you see these two features and that feature, and then this feature and that feature, and then they activate that one, right? And then that one, but there's also this one activates this one for whatever reason, and then that connects there, and then they connect to the final output, okay? So this is what the model needs to learn usually, okay? So it needs to learn these links, okay? So how does it connect to these links? And these, are, these things are called the weights. And you will see that it's actually pretty straightforward how it works, uh, but it's almost like uh, you're predicting the next value. So you're, you're saying, well, if I have, the, and I know this value and I, and I know this value. Why do you know them? Because these are pixels, right? So this is a pixel. So I know those pixel values, right? And then these pixels times some number, let's say W1, Let's say this is, this is X1, right? And then this is X3. So then W1 and W3, whenever we have these, these, we've learned what W1 and W3 are. We've learned what X1 and X3 are. So then whenever we have one of these, right, uh, we get this value, okay? And then this value, just like we knew X1, X2, we could say this is called uh, in hidden layer one, in layer one, we could say that's neuron one. So we know what that value is, just like we know what X one is, now we know what this value is. And that allows us, if this is X 784, and we calculate W 784, now we know over here what this value is. And then now we can combine these, you know, let's say another set of Ws, and we can predict this value. And then we calculate another W, and then 
plus we also know this w, so we need to know that w to know that value. And then if we find another w, now we can predict what this value is. You see that we have it because it's propagating. All the information is propagating. And then finally, if we know this w and we figure out what the appropriate w should be there, we know the value of this, right? And the thing is, that's the thing that you're trying to learn because this is given. We are trying to learn, let's say, uh, that whenever we see a cat over here, let's say that this is a cat, then we want this label to be cat. If, and so this is the network that should trigger, okay, if we see a cat. However, if we see a dog, let's say we see a dog over here, then the network might learn, you know what, uh, let, let's add a few more here. All right, and let's say that now, you know, you have some, for dog, you have these features, X7, you know, X9, whatever, and it could be X3 too. And then it learns that, okay, whenever I see that X3, I activate this neuron. And then these two activate that neuron. It just learns it that way. But I need to figure out these Ws. So I'm gonna figure out what these are. Okay, again, I have those Ws. Now these two, for whatever reason combined, activate this one. So I need to know these Ws, right? I need to figure out what they are. Give it, I know how to predict these two values, right? Because I have X7, X9. I know those values are the pixels. I also know the Ws here, right? I know those Ws there. And so, um, I can predict this value and this value. Then I calculate these Ws over here and that gives me that neuron, right? And then finally, that neuron uh, connects here, right? Connects there. It might turn out that, that I also have yet another neuron that was important, another pixel. And that pixel actually connected to that neuron with a W. And then that one actually connected to that neuron. I need to figure out that W. And then these two together activate that other neuron there. Or actually, let's say it activates, for whatever reason, another one. So I need to figure out these Ws. And then finally, these two activate only dog. You see that? So whenever I see... That's what, that's what you're trying to do with this type of algorithm, right? This type of algorithm needs to learn these weights, okay? In particular, it tries to learn. So the goal is, you know, learn the weights, okay? So you want to learn the weights. Um, and then different, you know, in, in, in a cat, you know, the pixels will be different, right? So, you know, you have two images here. So this, maybe the, you know, the something is different here with the dog. It has like a long nose or whatever. That triggers a set of features that is not triggered in the cat. And so that's where the pixels come in place. So this might be the nose of the dog, whereas this is something else of the cat. And so Every iteration, for many, 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 many iterations, you are giving the model the image like this, right? So you're giving the model that image, and you're also giving it the label. So every iteration, you just repeat it. You know, here's the X, here's the Y, and then here's the architecture. And the model has to train, has to somehow figure out these weights, okay? So it has to figure out these weights, and, excuse me, it has to say, okay, whenever I see cat, I need to trigger this one. Whenever I see dog, I need to trigger this one. And so it starts to create these architectures that are fully connected. So as you can see, once you have the right weights, you know that you start to create the right combinations to arrive at the appropriate value. 
where the values here are usually things like, and this can vary, uh, but these values are going to be something like, you know, if it's a dog, it's a one and a zero, right? And if it's a cat, it's a zero and a one. So that's what you kind of train to do, right? So whenever it's a dog, the network that it, you know, the red network should make this value zero. Zero. If it's a dog, but the uh, purple network should make this value one because, you know, it's a dog. And then the, you know, the, and if it's a cat, it, it's the opposite. Okay, so that is the goal. Um, then that's in, 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 in intuitively, that's what a um, artificial neural network is. Does this make sense, guys? Are there any questions? Uh, no questions. Questions, all right. So that's the basic algorithm, uh, the basic uh, idea. Right, the basic idea. There are three, there are a few concepts. We're not going to go into all the details because a lot of the technologies, actually, for the for uh, deep neural networks, we're just going to, you can use things like something called uh, TensorFlow or there's something else called PyTorch. And there's a few other ones. Okay, there's a few other ones. Let me say dot, dot, dot. So, um, we don't have to do all, all the things, right? Usually we just have to define the architecture and define kind of what we want to do and some parameters. And then uh, those libraries kind of take care of everything else. But just today, intuitively, we're going to think about how uh, this, this sort of works. So the idea is, uh, and so there's a few, uh, you know, concepts that you will see. Uh, you know, there's the feed forward algorithm. And we're not going to get into these algorithms because these algorithms are just about what is done behind the scenes. So the feed, feed forward algorithm. And then there's back propagation. There's also something called gradient descent. All right, so, and these involve, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of detail here. They're, algor they're all algorithms, of course, um, but there, you know, there's a bit of math involved in them. So we're not, they, they even use calculus. Um, so we're not gonna get into all the details of them, except to say that these algorithms are used to figure out the weights, okay? So they, they, they're used together to figure out, to figure out, the weights. Okay, so that's basically, um, that's basically the plan. Okay, that's basically the plan. So let me, let's just take a short uh, two minute break, guys. I'll, I'll be right back. Just short break. All right, so recording is back on, volume on. All right, so, um, so we were talking about uh, this idea, right? So we have an, that, that thing that we were describing before, the neural network, right? And we want to learn those, figure out those weights. That's really the key. Because it's like you build, you know, you build the, the, the architecture, you, you set up the post or whatever, but you have to put in those cables and you have to say how strong the connection is between the cables. Okay, so to figure out those weights, you use these techniques, All right? So it's something like you take the first layer, right? So I'm going to do this with just like two things. Um, so you take the first two layers and you know what X1 and X2 are because that's your data. And then over here, you're just going to connect to another two. So you do, you, you know there's a connection, but that you know, you have to figure out what these values are. So what you do is you first randomly, kind of randomly assign values to Ws, to w, this W, so W1 and W2. You randomly assign the values, and then you predict this value. Let's call it 
you know, this is hidden layer, this is input. So this is hidden layer one. And then we're just gonna have one uh, final layer, okay? So then we're gonna say, well, uh, I can calculate this value, hidden layer one, um, neuron one. So let's say hidden layer one, neuron one. And then this would be neuron two. Right, so if you think about it, hidden layer one and then hidden uh, one, right, like that. And so um, you figure out that it's going to be x1 times w1 plus x2 uh, times w2. That's, that's kind of the formula that is assumed here. It's, this is called the linear sum. And then these predict this value, right? Because they were just randomly set. And then you do the same for this one. But here you have one thing. You know if it's a cat or a dog. So you know it's a cat or dog. And so you're going to have, um, this is going to be one and this is zero, for instance. Assuming that this sample this is a uh, cat over here picture, and this was a cat label. So then that means that when you calculate, you take H1, N1, right? And now you're going to say, well, that neuron, which is H1, N1, right? The, that one. So you can see it's being sent there, right? And then now you just have to figure out another W, right? A different W here. So we multiply times W. And that gives us this value, which is the output, right? So this is the output. Let's call it, um, you know, Y, the Y uh, or the, the output. Let's actually call it output. So then this is uh, output. Right, and so we can say then, you know, the output is that, that it is the result of this, right, that multiplication. And so once we've got that value, we, we can take what we predicted. So here, the value was supposed to one, but let's say because we picked these values randomly, it actually out came out to be zero. So the, the real one, so let's say this is the actual, and this is the predicted one. Oops. This is the predicted one, right? And now we, we compare them and we see, okay, well, there's a big, you know, what's the difference, you know, between one and zero? Okay, it's, it's a difference of one. Versus if they had been the same, one and one, the, you know, the difference would have been zero here. So they were pretty much the same, whereas here, the difference is one. And so given that sort of that error that occur, right, that error that occur, that allows you, this information allows you to say, you know what, I need to update these weights because these weights are incorrect, right? You know, the weights that I selected here randomly gave me a zero. What I wanted was to get a one. So basically the way it works is, think of, think of it intuitively, right? If this had been, so if this had been a one, so if this had been a one, then basically the difference would have been zero. So you can think of the, the update rule. Let, let me write it over here. The update rule for a, for a W would be what? the actual w plus or minus that difference right so that difference you know times some value right some value so if you think about it if the difference between these two is zero then what happens to the weights zero times whatever value is gives you just w you see that guys so you, st and why, why is that intuitively correct? It's intuitively correct because you randomly selected some W's and they gave you a one. And then when you, com you compared it to the real value, they were the same. Therefore, those weights are good. 
So there's no real need to update, right? So that's, you know, that's kind of the, the, the way you can think about it. On the other hand, if uh, you predicted the value and it gave you a, a zero, it gave you a zero, right? But the real value was a one, then there's a difference of one. So now if we take a look at the update rule for the weights, what does it look like? So now it looks like W is W plus the difference. In this case, the difference is one value. So guess what? You end up updating W, right? So W becomes W becomes W plus the value. Do you see that? And so it's going to be updated. It's going to depend on various other things such as you, you know, you want to know if you should subtract, you know, maybe you want to take out from weights or add to weights. So all of that. And of course, it's, it's not always just zero or one. It could be that the value predicted was maybe, you know, let's say intuitively 0.5, right? So then the difference is 0.5. So then, you know, the weight is incremented or decreased by 0.5 instead of one. So that value is, is de decreased. As well. So that's the intuition of what's going on here. So remember, you start with your x's, pick the values sort of randomly at first, do all these calculations, arrive at the value of the real label, sort of compare the difference. And there's a lot of ways of doing that. That is called, you know, calculate the loss function. Then with that information, you work your way back Right, so you're gonna work your way back to update the Ws. Once you've updated this W, then you can use that information to calculate the previous Ws. And that is called backpropagation. So if you think about it, now in a, in a cleaner uh, sheet, let's go over here. Right, so, so let's say this is the output, this is the input, Right, we got some neurons here, dot, dot, dot. Say we just have two neurons here. So let me All right, so we've got something like this. And so first to calculate, let's say the neurons going forward, this is called, you know, as I said, you start with the random weights, right? And you make your way, you know, forward somehow. And that is called, you know, you're going that way, right? So you start with the X's, some, some weights that predicts the next neuron. You use those values to predict, you know, calculate other random, other random, get this value. That's a one, but you compare, you know, the actual the pred predicted value. So you predict actually this value. That's why it's supervised learning. You have the labels, you take the difference, and then you work your way back to update all those weights, but now with this information, the information that, you know, they were the same. Therefore, the update is really leaving, you know, may, basically try to leave the weights unchanged and so on. And so one of these is called, uh, you know, feed forward algorithm. The other one is called a back propagation. And then there also, you know, the, the way that you, you know, going back to this idea that I said of, of you know, is this a plus or a minus, et cetera. That's where gradient descent comes in. And the gradient descent algorithm kind of does a uh, similar thing, right? So you have uh, a search space and then the algorithm is trying to figure out, well, should this be a plus one or a minus one? Should it be a 0 0.5 or a minus 0 0.5? And so the algorithm does some things, right? So it gets into analyzing functions, right? So it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna do some math so if you think about it, this, this function here is y minus fx, right, squared, right? Where this function is, this is the actual value, cat, 
Whereas what is fx? What is fx? fx is this whole thing, right? Because f is the, the whole thing and the input is x. And so it's called fx. So really what this is saying is if I take an x value, run it through this whole architecture and predict this value, that's called fx. If I already have the value, that's called y. So then I take the difference between the two, which is pretty much what I've been doing here. Okay. And the, the, the reason why you square it is because, you know, there might be a negative value in there, but you just want to know the distance between the two items, for instance. There's other, there are other loss functions, but in general, this is, you know, the most intuitive one uh, to understand. And so gradient descent, what it does is it takes a look at this function Right, it takes a look at that function and it, you know, let's say the function sort of looks like that. I don't know, some function. And now the gradient descent algorithm will try to do in this space, it tries to find, so this function represents, this is, these are the weights and this is the cost. Okay, weights and cost. And so what's happening here is, you know, you pick a certain weight, right? So you're, you're gonna, you know, what weight do I pick? You know, do I go in that direction or do I go in that direction, right? And so basically that weight, how does that weight fit into fx? Well, fx is, is this, right? fx is that. So if you think about it, fx is something like w1, x1 plus w2, x2, dot, 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 w n x n right so something like that and so if you think about it fx depends on w's so fx depends on w's because they're right there right and so this cost function what it does is that it determines which w gives you the best cost or the worst cost okay you know so that is to say what would be something that gives you the best cost? Well, if y, if y and fx are both one, right? So they're the same. That's what you want. So if you pick a, the right weights, you'll get this, and that's what you want. But if you pick the wrong weights, you could get that, and so that's you know not what you want, and so that is being captured in this function. Okay that function so you that you know you pick the w's that minimize the error that's what it's called minimize the error and so that's the intuition with the, the if we plot the function that previous function you know we can just pick one of the w's let's say w1 all right so if you pick w1 to be this value what does that mean it means that the cost is right there you see it's got a high cost so that's maybe intuit intuitively you can say the difference between y and fx in this scenario will be like 0 0.5. So it's not great. And then if I pick a w that is like there, okay, that's the cost of it. So the intuition for that one is that the cost would be, you know, let's say one. Okay. However, if I pick, let's say this w, right? then the cost will be a lot lower, right? So that might be the, that might be the, the, the best W that you can get. You can't get a better W. And that one, what it might mean is that the cost is zero. That is to say the difference between Y and FX is zero because they're the same, okay? And so the gradient descent algorithm kind of helps you to, to do this, okay? It plays this little game with the function because you know, I don't want to get into this part, but you know, it does it takes the function, takes the derivative of it, and it evaluates that derivative derivative at a particular point in the function. Okay, so like that, or like that, or like that. So if you notice, what's important about this is that the shape of this, that what is called the slope of this tangent line. You can, you can, it turns out you can figure out by taking the derivative of a function, you can figure out where you are in the, in the function, 
right? By saying, okay, am I like this? Am I like that? Or am I like that? Because if depending on this shape, you decide what to do with W. Remember that if you want to go in that direction, what do you have to do to W? Decrease it, right? You have to decrease it. If you want, if you're here, because that's your shape and you want to go in that direction, what do you do? You increase W, correct? You know, a higher W because it goes from zero to N, let's say, whatever the value is. Now, let me ask you this question. What would be the optimal point then? Um, let's say that we said that the cost is here, right? This is the optimal cost. So here, if you look at this line, this line doesn't have a slope. It's kind of just parallel, right, to this, to the, to the, this line. So then that tells you there's no need to move. You've arrived. You're, you're neither going up or down. So you're kind of at the, so that's what you're looking for with the gradient descent algorithm. You're trying to decide, you know, go right, go left. Um, and once you get to this point, should I, you know, should I stop there? Have I found the optimal, optimal W? And then this is what you do. So these three algorithms that we talked about, uh, feed forward, back propagation, and gradient descent, kind of take care of all of that. Now, lucky for us, we don't have to code any of this. Uh, this has already been taken care of as I said, by those libraries, TensorFlow, PyTorch, they, they very efficiently use a lot of the, a lot of techniques that are um, within the, these names. Okay. But ultimately these three algorithms are, are very important. Okay. Very important. They've made all of this possible. And so we are able to eventually figure out the, the correct weights that give us our neural net. Does this make sense, guys? Are there any questions? Uh, no questions. It's making sense. All right, great. Again, this is, you know, I just want you to understand this from the point of view of, of intuition, right? So that, you know, that's really, most of the time, all you have to do is set up the architecture and then you literally don't have to worry about, um, you literally don't have to worry about feed forward or back propagation or gradient descent. So you don't really have to worry about them, but it's good to kind of be familiar with the, the main ideas um, of this. And then that takes us then to, you know, once we set up the architecture, we have our, 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 our model, let's say like this. So now we've done the training, we've got the weights. Next time around, you give it a new image of a cat or a dog, it'll run through the network and it'll predict, I think it's a cat because it's already learned the correct weights. As I said, by first feeding forward, comparing the loss, then back propagating, and, you know, all of this is calculated via, uh, you know, the gradient descent algorithm, okay? All right, so that's uh, the intuition. So let's now, okay, so we've talked about that. Um, So now, so now hopefully that, that is the, the main ideas, all right, of what we're trying to do. So obviously I, I don't plan to code anything that complex, um, you know, but I will talk a little bit about um, the perceptron. So, so let's talk a little bit about, so, you know, what are we doing here ultimately? Ultimately, this is called optimization, okay? So this is called ultimately optimization. We do this all the time, right? So optimization, 
you know, when do you do this, do this? Let's say that you have a lot of things to do on a specific day. You have a lot of errands to run, uh, you know, and, and different things like that. And so you have to go to a lot of places. You are going to think, you know, before you do it, right? So you're going to think, okay, you know, I should go to this place first and that place and that place just because, you know, you have a lot of variables in play. You know, you have basically maybe meetings at specific times. Uh, appointments, um, one place is further away than another, you know, so you got all these uh, different things and you want to find the most efficient way of solving the problem. Well, that's exactly what we're doing over here, right? So, you know, whenever you have a problem, you could just randomly. So instead of doing all this, learning these weights with feet forward back propagation, we could have just, you know, do this a billion times, run different weights. Every, every set of weights will allow us to compare this, right? And so eventually just keep the, the weights that do the best job, right? To keep the weights that do the best job. However, that may not be the, um, the most efficient way of doing it because it might take you a billion times to do it. Whereas if you took an approach that's more intelligent, might just take you a hundred iterations, right? But ultimately what we're doing is we are doing optimization. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the ideas. Okay. All right, so... Um, a lot of these techniques, um, you know, like the back propagation algorithm, for instance, so the back propagation algorithm, um, were developed, you know, by people, right? So that algorithm is actually can be attributed to Rummelhart. These, these people are extremely important in, 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 in deep learning and machine learning. So Rommel Hart, uh, Jeffrey Hinton in particular, some people call him the grandfather of uh, deep learning and Williams. So they wrote a very important paper uh, in, in, that was published in Nature. So Nature is like the top journal in the world. Uh, so if you want to take a read through that one, because you're, you know, you're curious, uh, just look up uh, the journal issue 323 and then 6088. All right, and then it's from 1986. So you can see that all, of, all of these things are fairly recent, if you think about it, um, that the algorithm was, was around. The, the algorithm actually arrived before the technology could use it, or before the technology was available to use the algorithm. So in 1986, computers were a bit uh, slow, you know, and so the algorithm was there, but not so much the, the hardware that could run it. Okay, but uh, you know, they're very important. Jeffrey Hinton in particular, it's a very famous person. And also go on Scholar, you know, like Google Scholar. Just take a look at, you know, look for that uh, paper and just look at the number of citations that it has. It probably has many, many, many citations. All right, um, and, and so on, right? So a lot of these algorithms come from somewhere, but Jeffrey Hinton in particular is very important for uh, the field of machine learning and deep learning. So um, basically, though, before, you know, let's say where we are now historically, right, so this is 2021, right, and historically, neural nets, you know, where we are right now is, you know, in a very impressive area of deep neural net, deep neural network. Uh, deep neural networks, actually, if I go back, I, I need to go back to like the 1940s, 
right? So the big people, you know, Bell Labs, basically, Bell Labs. This is where it kind of started. Um, you know, important people like Claude Shannon and, and, and people like that, right? So if you think about it, in the 1940s is where we get the perceptron. So we get the perceptron here. This is the algorithm that we will discuss this week. It kind of looks like this, right? It kind of looks like that. But you can think of this, this thing that you see here is like the great, 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 great grandchild of that original perceptron, right? So the perceptron is, you know, the, the first program that actually did these things. Um, obviously the math, you know, a lot of the, a lot of that is built, built on, you know, math. So before, you know, I should say there's, you know, the math, philosophy, whatever, um, that, that from which a lot, a lot of these ideas, of course, came from, you know, but really, if we want to start thinking about machine learning in general, um, you know, kind of, we can pretty much think, I guess, there, as I said, Claude Shannon uh, was working on AI. He's, you know, look him up. He's got, he's very interesting character. He developed a maze, a robotic, a robot mouse, which was just a magnet, robot mouse in a maze, right? And he, the, he, it would learn to solve and find the cheese, basically. That's Claude Shannon, you know, more in reinforcement learning AI. But then we get to Bell Labs. I believe it was at Bell Labs that we had uh, Rosenblatt. So Rosenblatt. And Rosenblatt came up with the perceptron, the implementation of it somewhere around that time. Um, so we can start there so that we have a beginning. Okay, and today, you know, or maybe not today, but this, this week, we will start looking at the perceptron algorithm. But the perceptron al algorithm, you will see, has a lot of elements of this, right? A lot of elements of that. Um, and so this, now the, with the perceptron, we're, we're going to code everything from scratch, but it doesn't have everything, right? So it's not going to have everything. Like, it, it doesn't really use, um, you know, it's not going to use, like, gradient descent or anything like that. Those were add-ons you know, adding, you know, cost functions and, and adding things like that, that, w that came later, you know, it was um, later historically. But at least with the perceptron, we have a beginning and some of the ideas are there. Um, right after the perceptron, uh, this was uh, done at Bell Labs, then came a PhD um, dissertation of something called Adaline. I remember correctly. All right, so it's a, it, this, you know, it's an evolution of the perceptron uh, that it started to have some of the improvements. And then, you know, a lot of a lot of things happened. We saw already 19, 60 years plus 20, so about there. Um, we saw in around 1990, 1986, right? We saw in 1986, uh, you know, uh, who was it, Hinton and Williams, they came, came up with, uh, as I said, we look at this paper, so Rommel Hart, Williams, uh, they came up with the back propagation algorithm. So Rommel, please spell his name, Rommel Hart, Williams, Right, and they, uh, this is back propagation. So I just want you to, you know, why am I doing this? Well, I love history, but also because I want you to appreciate that to get to this thing. So, so I'm gonna give you this, you know, in about two weeks, I'm gonna give you this thing called Keras, right? And then you'll be able to do a lot of things. You can get up and running with Keras in, in, in a couple of lectures. 
but you know just you know appreciate the fact that it's taken easily 80 years this is about 80 years to develop all these ideas right so 80 years span uh to develop all these ideas of um you know to where you are um so if you think about it you know jeffrey hinton actually i always like to tell this story of because jeffrey hinton is such a such a you know it's such an interesting story in perseverance okay perseverance never give up on your dreams that's you know if i can you know give you you know where everybody everybody always says um don't give up on your dreams you know always go after your dreams etc but nobody gives you an example right so i you know let me give you the example of jeffrey hinton right so he's a professor uh at um Toronto University in, in Toronto, right? And for the longest time, obviously this, this period of time, probably the seventies, you know, all that period until this is about 2000, he was basically, he just loved neural nets. And he just kept working on it. And this is, you, you can call this the dark ages of neural networks. These were the, literally the dark ages of neural networks, right? But he continued working, you know, they would write these algorithms. And what was the problem? The problem was that they were evolving the algorithms, the techniques, the ideas, but the hardware was not there, all right? There was no hardware that could support, you know, doing the parallel computing that's necessary. Just think about when we go back, right? Think about this idea of feed forward and back propagation. This is a very simple network and look at how many weights we have to calculate. Imagine if this is 784, right? That's 784 weights just for this one. Now multiplied by the fact that maybe this has 100 neurons. So that's 784 times 100. And then now take that to the next layer and the next layer and you end up with millions of weights. I mean, I'm not kidding, millions of weights. And so in a CPU, in, a, in an old computer from the 80s, there was no way that you could get those weights. You just couldn't. And so people, you know, I think Jeffrey Hinton himself tells the story that whenever he went to parties or he went to like gatherings or conferences, you know, whatever, they would have like, you know, all the people in, in computing, and they would have all these tables. And because he was kind of just doing these algorithms and people never look, you know, think that technology will not evolve. Basically, it's like they were putting him and his colleagues, people working in this field, in like the kitty table, right? So they were like outcasts. And oh, yeah, there's that group that's working on back propagation. Ha ha ha. Right. But, you know, that didn't bother uh, Jeffrey Hinton. He just kept, you know, working on it. 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. It wasn't until 2007 that something happened. And as I said, Jeffrey Hinton just kept working, you know, because he just loved what he was doing, right? So he just kept working on this. And then in 2007, a revolution happened, right? And the revolution was in the hardware. So I want you to I want you to know that actually I'm gonna mark this the revolution in the hardware and in particular parallel computing right parallel computing you know we got GPUs why did we get GPUs because Nvidia and those companies had a huge market of people that play video games right so for video games they were developing these technologies and as it turns out video games are very much vectors and matrices. So you've, you've noticed the, this whole semester, right? We've been playing with NumPy, with vectors and matrices. Well, as it turns out, video games are all about vectors and matrices and, and efficient multiplications of X, uh, X times something, right? So in this case, X times W vector to get Y. Maybe I should say to get, let's say, the y vector over here. 
the y vector like that, right? So um, so it's basically a, you know, a type of operation, and as it turns out, that same operation is done all the time in, in video games. You know, whenever you have like a first person shooter or something, and you want to move them from here to, to that direction, you just multiply times some vector, and now you, know, you can move it or something. And so it's the same set of operations that you use in machine learning that you use in video games. As it turns out then, in 2007, companies like NVIDIA, right, and others I'm sure, came up with these GPUs. Obviously very smart people immediately figured things out. People like Jeffrey Hinton, et cetera, and his group, you know, started saying, well, we've got all these theories, but now we can test them, right? You know, and deep neural networks need a lot of data. They, they definitely need a lot of data to learn. Um, so, so there is that as well. But um, what happened with the hardware was that they started then writing their own code. Now, what language did they probably use for this? C and C++. So they started doing C, C++, and with a li the library in NVIDIA GPUs is called CUDA, the CUDA library. And so they started doing, so still at this time, 2007, people didn't know much about, um, or very little about deep learning. I'll be honest with you guys. I, I knew around this time about, about you know, I knew about um, what were called multilayer perceptrons, neural nets, but I, I didn't really know about deep neural nets, you know, because it's the same thing, you know, you know, people I knew knew that it was, you know, it's, it's all theoretical, but the, it's impossible to process all that data. But people like Jeffrey Hinton never gave up, never gave up, right? And so again, you know, that's, that's when you love something, you know, even if it seems, you know, you never know, right? And so they continue to work. They now had algorithms, right? Math, algorithms, et cetera, code. Now they had, thanks to NVIDIA and the, and the gamers in 2007, they had parallel computing in GPUs. They have the incredibly powerful language of C, C++, which by the way, I don't know if you guys know this, also developed at, at Bell Labs around the 50s, I think. It, was pro it probably came a little bit in the 50s. Can't remember when, but uh, sometime there in, in Bell Labs as well. And then what happened? So in 2012 is the critical moment. There was a competition of image recognition in 2012. Image recognition. This is the first like serious thing that happened fairly recently, I think, if I remember. Uh, there's, so what happens is in machine learning, and it basically in every area of, you know, karate or chess, right, soccer, you know, uh, foot, you know Super Bowl, right, all these kinds of things, that's the best way that you find the best in the world, right? You have some competition. So every year there was, I, I forget the, the name of the conference, but there was a competition for image recognition. All right, so there was a competition for image recognition. Every year, groups from all over the world would get images of cats, dogs, and I don't know, boats, cars, etc., and they would run them through their algorithms, like what you, you guys have learned. Like, so let's say you guys were in this class, they give you some images, and what are you gonna use? Okay, well, supervised learning, I'm gonna use cats and, you know, I'm gonna use Naibase and KNN. I know those two, I got the code. You would run them, you do whatever you want, and you would get, let's say, like, uh, so the accuracies were like 70%, let's say, accuracy, right? We know what that is. Everybody was getting 70 for years. So for years and years, eh, maybe somebody gets 72, but that could be, you know, chance. Then come Jeffrey Hinton and his group from the University of Toronto. The University of Toronto, right? I think that's how you write it. And so they came in, they ran the same problem, but instead of using Naive Bayes or KNN or 
support vector machines, which was all the rage back then, they use what is called a deep neural network. In particular, you know, they use, um, you know, a, a deep, yeah, deep neural network. So you have uh, used a deep neural network and then immediately they got something like 85 accuracy. <laughs> Way above, you know, that's significantly above every, where everyone else was around 70, they were a full 15% or more above. <laughs> And they won. So they won the competition. <clears throat> and then immediately, once this happened, guess what? Who's going to notice something like that? Well, people are trying to make money, right? So who comes in? Facebook. Uh, what's the other one? Google. And all of them, right? So I'm, I'm sure um, Apple, you know, all, all these companies. Dot, dot, dot. So they notice, have their eyes on this, they notice, and then they say, we want to do the same. So they started also, well, what did Jeffrey Hinton did? He used all these algorithms. He used this thing called deep neural networks and C, C++, CUDA, et cetera. They started working on that. Between 2012 and 2015, 2015, uh, Google developed their own thing, just like Facebook developed their own thing. So I believe Facebook's is called PyTorch, which by the way, it's really great. I don't want you to think that I'm somehow saying that PyTorch is not good because I'm gonna use TensorFlow in this class, okay? All right, if we have time, actually, I would like to, because we're gonna do very little in, uh, in TensorFlow and Keras this semester. So what I, I would actually like, if I have time, to use PyTorch instead. But I, I'm just not sure, you know, I can. But basically, they came up with their own solutions, right? And as it turns out, around 2015, Google released it. And I think it was November or December of, of uh, 2015. They released TensorFlow. PyTorch came, I believe, in a little later, like one year later, probably, or something like that. And they made our lives a lot easier because if you were implementing, like if you're Jeffrey Hinton in 2012, you have to use C and CUDA. You have to do all of this, right? You have to do all of this, but you also have to do all of this. You have to implement these algorithms feed forward, back prop gradient descent. So there's a lot of moving parts, right, that can make developing code, plus you're doing it in C, C++, plus a library called CUDA, plus you're doing it in the GPU, which means you have to program completely differently from the way that you're used to programming, which, you know, you guys, you know, programming in parallel is different than programming sequentially on a CPU. It just, it takes time to get used to. Even TensorFlow takes a little bit of getting used to, but this is, it, this is challenging for sure, okay? And so what they did is uh, these, I, you know, I want you to understand this, these companies wanted to avoid that and abstract uh, backprop, feed forward, and gradient descent and all that, and just leave you with a simpler thing. So that's why they created TensorFlow and PyTorch, as you know, those are libraries in Python. And basically the way that it works in Keras is, is pretty easy, is you just have to literally like set this architecture up in Keras and then set a few parameters here and there, loss functions. And then mainly it's all about your data. So the, the X and the Y, right? So the X and the Y is really the, the main concern. And so they abstracted a lot of the problems so that you don't have to worry about them. All right, and so that's really uh, where we are, you know. Uh, in 2015 also came uh, what is called um, DQN. So if you think about um, Q learning, right? So we learned Q learning just before spring break. Well, as it turns out, that Q learning that I uh, showed you before can be enhanced by implementing it as a deep learning algorithm. 
So supposedly is very powerful. This came around 2015 um, and it made, it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it's more challenging though uh, to comprehend. And then as of late, I haven't really, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some new developments that have happened um, in the last three years, but um, I'm always behind. I mean, it, it's, it's so difficult to keep up nowadays. But I know the, the very last that I know that is very significant thing that has happened is something called uh, transformers. So this in 2017, we are at the newest algorithm, transformers. This is incredibly powerful. It's used for language translation. And I don't know if you guys ever have a need for translating languages. But we are at a stage where, where this actually works. So universal translator from Star Trek, you know, we're getting close to that. Um, yeah, so, and, and of course, I, you know, I'm always like extremely concerned about this, right? You know, what's going on um, over here? I know uh, one big development that technically speak, technical development that happened, um, I think in 2020, 20 was that we got TensorFlow 2. So basically when, when, it, when TensorFlow came out in 2015, it was called TensorFlow 1. Now in 2020, we've got TensorFlow 2. It's kind of a rewrite of the algorithm. So it makes it a little bit more, it's challenging. I mean, TensorFlow, it's, it's kind of messy. And so because they're constantly innovating and, and, and they have like seven different ways of doing the same thing. And it's just, it's getting complicated. But at, at the same time, what's good about it is that for instance, in this class, you're learning everything in NumPy, right? And NumPy is actually, they have modeled TensorFlow the way that NumPy is. They actually want to use some things interchangeably. So if you're learning NumPy, you know, you should feel good about yourself that you're actually learning, um, you know, how TensorFlow works, how PyTorch works. I believe I even heard there's a new thing called uh, JAX. And JAX is the NumPy, I believe, the NumPy um, deep neural nets set of tools. Okay, so who knows? where that's going, but there's a new one out there. So anyway, you know, I always like to do this. Um, I feel that when you have context and you know the history and you know, you understand why we're learning all these things, right? So, you know, why I make the choices that I make, you know, uh, PyTorch, uh, a lot of people say it's easier than TensorFlow. So it's certainly something to consider if you like this field. Um, I, I ha I've had some students that even though we cover um, TensorFlow, they just gravitate to PyTorch. They just love it. Some people that use TensorFlow 1 say now that TensorFlow 2 is out, instead of learning a whole new thing, they, might, they may just as well learn PyTorch and gravitate towards that. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of things going on. But anyway, so hopefully um, by in about two weeks, we will get to Keras. Let me, let me see if I have another color here. Right, so hopefully, you know, Keras uh, with TensorFlow 1 or 2, doesn't matter, I think. So hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll do, it should just take like a week to get up and running with that. On the other side of the spectrum, we've got the Perceptron. Okay, and so we're gonna, we're not gonna look at everything that has happened in between these two, but we're gonna start at the beginning. So basically not today, but on Wednesday, we'll go over the perceptron algorithm, okay? And just kind of get a feel for that. We're gonna write it from scratch in NumPy. Then after that, we're gonna, usually the, the, the sequence is linear regression, logistic regression, uh, a neural net, and then a deep neural. So it's kind of that sequence because they're all similar, right? So Perceptron, I'm not going to cover Adeline, so I won't cover that, but I will start at the beginning. This is certainly the simplest. So I also want, there's some interesting ideas there that we want to take a look at, get a feel for. Um, 
And that's it. And hopefully, you know, uh, as we look to the future, I, I really, you know, I really hope that you guys will be involved in that future in some way. Um, so yeah, that's it. So that's the history. <laughs> any, any questions or comments, thoughts? No questions here. No questions. All right. Um, good. So, um, in in uh, that sort of concludes our lecture for today. Next Wednesday, you know, I've given you now. I've done what I wanted to do, right? So I didn't want to just dive into the perceptron, and then you don't really get the point of it. Now I've gone over this. You kind of understand it's like an evolution. So. Have you guys ever seen that picture where you see like, you know, you see like a, like a lake and then you see like a fish and then you see like, a, like a, like a great ape and then you see like um, Neanderthals and then Cro-Magnon and then, you know, humans and so on, right? So that's kind of what we were talking about here. So the perceptron is sort of the beginning and then arriving at where we are. All right, so on uh, Wednesday, so on Wednesday, on Wednesday, we will go over, uh, just we'll, now we understand hopefully the ideas. So if there's some ideas that you didn't get, just go back um, to the video. I'll post this video later on. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, we will go over the perceptron code and then just go from there. Hopefully, we'll arrive at Kara's uh, not to, obviously, you can't really do much with the perceptron, uh, but you can do a lot with Keras, okay, with the deep neural net in Keras. And so uh, this one is just more for your own understanding, as it is a very simplified uh, algorithm from basically the 19. 40s and 50s. Okay. And that's it. All right. So I'll stay for a couple of minutes. If you have any questions, let me actually save these slides. I will post this on your um, on the bright space environment. And then um, so I've saved it. And lose this. Let me stop sharing. All right, so I've uh, all right, so I'll be posting that PDF on Brightspace on the Brightspace environment. All right, so I'll stay for a couple of minutes. I'm going to stop the recording now.